Welcome to Genuine Humans, exploring the stories behind the great marketing leaders of our time and hearing how their journeys have influenced the brands they've built. Brought to you by The Social Element, here are our hosts, Tamara Littleton, CEO and founder, and Wendy Christie, Chief People Officer. Welcome back to Genuine Humans, and I'm delighted, as always, to have Wendy here as our co-host. Wendy, how are you doing? Hello, Tamara. Yeah, really good, thank you. How are you doing? It's, it's a bit dark at the moment, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, a bit dark and cold. <laughs> I'm, I'm battling battling with myself. Don't put the heating on. It's only you in the house, but no, <laughs> I'm giving in. <laughs> well, we are also delighted to be joined today by Emma Ingalls, and Emma is the Head of Marketing for Kath Kidson. Welcome, Emma, to the show. Hello. And Emma, it would be great to get a little bit of time for you to sort of talk to us about your journey and how you got to be the head of marketing for Kath Kidson and sort of how you came into to be into marketing in the first place. So would you mind kind of going backwards, start as early as you want, but tell us your, your sort of career story? Yeah, I mean, it's quite a long time ago now, which is a bit scary in itself. But <laughs> yeah, I always been interested in um, kind of I guess a creative industry so when I left university I didn't really have a big plan I'd had um, quite a lot going on sort of personally so I ended up sort of doing a bit of a temporary role at, um, at BT and actually I had a great guy there who had a really senior job and quickly said to me uh, why are you doing this job you need to be on our graduate scheme so I think from a really early stage, I had someone really looking out for me. So I um, I ended up getting onto the BT graduate scheme as sort of, you know, my first job. And I spent seven and a half years in, in BT. And, you know, the corporate world was, was amazing. And I think mm. the, the marketing community in BT was incredible. I worked on really high profile projects. You know, it's when we were launching broadband, you know, to the oh, consumer. Yeah. So incredible experience great budgets and you know really great above the line experience and um that was I think a really great sort of solid foundation into the marketing world and you know had great experience managing agencies working with really senior people because actually one of the things about marketing is it's very very visible whether yes. you're a small business or whether you're in a big business. So I started there after seven and a half years. I felt like it was time to move on and um, and stretch my legs really. And um, I went to work for Royal Mail, which was you know I think very much a different a different vibe. But also I think I felt I could add value and I felt I could you know go and manage a bigger team. And actually I had sort of four great years. Definitely probably much drier uh, financial services and, and a huge sort of, I think, complexity that I hadn't probably experienced before. So I successfully did sort of four years there, ended up covering a maternity leave, which actually gave me, I think, real confidence to, um, you know, operate at a much higher level than what I had been doing previously. Mm. But then I think I just needed to get into something more creative and I wanted to I've always loved product and actually kind of shops and things have always I did a retail business marketing degree. So I think after probably sort of 15 years I was beginning to feel like I need to go and kind of itch that scratch so to speak. So I actually then did a sideways move in into John Lewis, which a few people were like, it is John Lewis, but should you be doing a sideways move? But I was really adamant that I needed to change sort of sector. And John Lewis was, I think, you know, a real high moment for me. Five years in John Lewis, I got promoted to a head of category, an amazing brand. And, you know, I think the real high days of um, of the momentum that the brand had at that point. So yes. I think if I look back on my career, you know, I, I, I was given an opportunity that was, I think, a real incredible moment for me and becoming head of marketing in John Lewis you know back in sort of seven years ago felt like I'd really made it personally for for myself and you'd always go to a dinner party and someone be like where do you work and you'd say John Lewis and everyone'd be like oh amazing (laughs) feeling and you know I worked on incredible projects 
and with lots of incredible people and I think an incredible privilege to kind of be part of that brand story to this day. But, you know, good things always come to an end and I think it was then time to move on and do something different. And I was very conscious at that point that I'd never really experienced a smaller brand Mm -hmm. Um, And I had a chance to work for a smaller brand, a founder led brand called White Stuff, which everyone did think it was White Company, but that was one of the challenges there. And actually, I think, you know, my learning, I had a bigger team, I managed all of the channels. And, you know, when you work in a small business, you are much more front and centre in front of the CEO. There's less resource, there's, you know, incredible opportunity, but incredible challenge as well. So I really relished, I think, growing and, you know, being able to, I guess, have a bit more ownership and a bit more control across across the marketing mix. But it definitely was a big challenge, um, less budgets, less, I think, sort of just in a big business, things, you know, are much more structured. And actually, yes. you have to create the structure or you have to find ways to, to kind of create consistency and and I think strong ideas with 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 a lot less and I I did personally find that quite challenging so I spent four years at White Staff built a team I think I rebuilt an incredible team there and then actually quite late in life for some people I got pregnant and I went off to have a baby which was an incredible journey and still is and I was definitely in my 40s at that point and then obviously the pandemic hit so I was due to go back to work And actually, probably for me, it was a bit of a blessing because I had a very young child and most people have to go back to work. And that obviously was the plan. But I ended up having another year at home with my little one. Nobody went anywhere. So actually, it was I think my baby bubble was was two years, which I think, you know, when you've worked for over 20 years, that time at home, I relished it. I felt incredibly lucky to have it. But then, obviously, I needed to go back out to work as things started to ease off. And I think at this point, I was really quite fussy about what I wanted to do. I always, you know, I think the things that I was reflecting on at that point was I was very passionate about retail and product. And I really Mm -hmm. didn't want to move away from that. But I really wanted to work for a brand that I think has real meaning. And actually, not purposely, but I've only really ever worked for British brands that have a lot of heritage and then very bizarrely, a job came up on um, on LinkedIn, but a recruiter that I knew said, you'd be perfect for this. And I had already missed the deadline for it, but she made a phone call. And within a day, I was being interviewed for Kath Kidson. And actually, that felt quite daunting. I hadn't been in work for two years. So feeling, you know, I guess quite vulnerable and definitely a bit shaky and had mm. I had I lost my mojo a bit because you're just not in the in the same world equally I think everyone felt a bit um discombobulated at that point <laughs> as people were working from home so I just put my best foot forward and actually I got offered the job you know a couple of stages later and um it was a real moment I think of feeling like you've kind of landed back in in the real world uh equally scared and, and feeling a bit um vulnerable but it's been 18 months now since I've been back at work. And mm-hmm. you no, know, I feel like there's definitely a lot of challenge in the retail industry at the moment. But, you know, slowly, slowly, I feel like we are beginning to get Kath Kidson, you know, in a in a much stronger place from, from a brand, having been, you know, through difficult times and, and lots of brands that are obviously experiencing that. So, yeah, feeling like there's obviously huge opportunity and I'm really excited about next year and I think I'm excited to bring the brand to life. Kath Kitten's actually going to turn 30 next year. Wow. wow, that is incredible. So I think a great opportunity to really shine a light on the brand and I think, you know, it is a brand that everybody loves and has a story quite similar. Obviously, it's not the same scale as John Lewis, but everyone says, oh, I bought bags for my kids or I've had you know, things I've bought my mum. And actually, it's one of those brands that I think really does, you know, have lots of emotional connection. And I think that's really important to me. And and thank you for talking about, you know, you sort of going back into the workplace after after the two years, because I, I think it's it's really important that people share that experience, but also that vulnerability, I personally think is such a powerful thing for leaders because I think it builds trust with your team to sort of actually have the confidence to sort of to be vulnerable I think the pandemic has also impacted 
on that that actually more people are just a bit more open about what's what's going on in their their lives so so perhaps everything happening at the same time was was actually a really positive thing for you yeah definitely and I think having children and sort of going back to work you know you have to I think have a bit of a different mindset and some days things go brilliantly and I do all the things that I wanted to do not that often and some days (laughs) things just go completely awry and you know sometimes someone's ill or something and I think you know I'm quite good at sharing that with my team to say do you know what I've got this to sort out I'm not going to be around for the next hour without feeling you know like it's a bad thing and I do think the world has moved on now so actually I think you know I feel that the flexibility that we all have in sort of a new hybrid world is is a really positive thing for all of us but I think I think for parents as well and I think you know being able to to do some days at home to do some pickups and to also be in the office is a great balance and I think you know it allows me to have a full-time leadership role in a a brand that I love and I think that would probably be really challenging kind of pre-pandemic just because you have to be around for your children it's as important as being around for your team and you know it's it's that balance but it's definitely tough at times but I think I work with lots of people who have got children you never quite appreciate the people who have had to leave early and all the things they had to do and until you are a parent and it's just one of those cliches in life that you maybe don't appreciate it but I equally feel like you know people are now I think much more open about mental health how they mm. feel and actually you know just being a working parent is, is is one part of that and I think that does mean that there's a much more level playing field now about people being able to you know take an hour out here we all obviously work incredibly hard when you're in any role but in a in a leadership job you obviously do lots of hours lots of extra stuff and and that's you know you manage that so I feel quite proud that I've managed to I think come back to work work full-time sustain it as well and hopefully you know my team feel like actually they don't have a different experience to to the Emma that was probably you know working five years ago so I think that's hugely positive for for all of us whoever you know whatever our family setup is definitely and is there any a piece of advice a little nugget you could share for anyone who's in that position you know that returning to work after maternity and feeling a bit insecure I think the key thing is that it takes time to get back into work and it's not something that in a week you feel like oh I've got this cracked and I think it is an ongoing process and you know you're not the same person you were when you went on maternity leave it's just that's just not possible I think key is to be open and talk to people about how you feel and about the support that you might need I think it's good to set yourself some personal goals in terms of some boundaries and sometimes you can keep to them and sometimes you can't but I think being able to say I'm going to try and start at this time I'm going to check emails at this time and you know there's some weeks which it doesn't work but I think just in your own mind being able to kind of set out how you think you can operate. Otherwise, I feel like, you know, you end up feeling like you're doing a bad job at work and a bad job at home. Mm. So I think that is important to sort of think about what things are working, what is not. You know, I'm really honest and I think that's important. There was quite early on in my role at Cath, you know, and I, Cath is a very sort of small, small business now. I had quite a big meeting with my CEO and my little one was poorly and I had to just say, I'm really sorry, I just haven't got anybody to, to to look after her and I need, and she just didn't bat an eyelid and it felt like a great time where I could say, I just can't do this now, but I can do it tomorrow. And that didn't feel like that was any problem at all. And I think, you know, that level of honesty when the wheels come off sometimes, you've got to be honest about that. Um, and I think, you know, it's not going to happen a month. It, it takes a few months, I think, to get back in into work and finding people who have been on the similar experience I think if you work in sort of bigger communities maybe you've got a bit more support around that but particularly when you're in small businesses I think finding people who even if they've got older kids you know people have similar experiences that's super important too. And and coming back to you and your journey if you don't mind I'd like to just broaden the context a little bit and consider how you know, looking back to your childhood experiences and how you were as a child, how that's shaped where you are now. So can we start with talking about what you were like when you were little? 
Uh, I'm, I'm quite petite, so I think actually I get kind of overshadowed by sort of people's heights. I think, you know, even, even as a young little person in school, I was always at the front with my legs crossed because, you know, you couldn't be at the back in the school photo. So I think I was sort of naturally quite shy, quite steely. And actually, that's probably something that gets described of me at the moment, like never, never underestimate me. But yeah, I think quite shy, quite creative. I used to love drawing, painting, not, not singing, not advert performances mm-hmm. but I guess more I do lots of drawing lots of sort of creative arts and crafts and things I loved I loved playing shops I, I remember having this um like a post office and it was in like a suitcase back in the 80s and you could like get it out and you know create your own so I sort of loved doing that which you know probably is a, a bit of a part of where I am now I had a big scary older brother who was you know pretty brutal so I think actually (laughs) steeliness probably came through quite early on without maybe realizing it and then um I had a younger brother sort of a few years behind me so I sort of ended up being sandwiched in between sort of two brutal boys really um (laughs) but yeah I think um had a very sort of happy childhood uh, a bit dysfunctional um you know my parents split up when I was quite small but um saw lots of my dad which is great and you know I've got a great relationship with all my sort of stepbrothers and sisters to this day I mean I did lose my mum when I was a young adult I was in my last year of university and my mum had had a heroic battle with cancer in mm-hmm. most of my teenage years and sadly it got the better of her in my final year of university and it came very suddenly and sort of I think when you sort of deal with that kind of trauma you know at that age in some ways I think you don't realize maybe what's happened and you know you you kind of have this you know I'd got a new life sort of outside of the family home that's definitely shaped I think who I am today my mum was a housewife she didn't have a career but she always said to me I want you to have a career you you know you can make something of your life and I think I always have her sort of sitting on my on my shoulder in in some of the tough times and actually you know I had to kind of get myself back ready to go to university sit my finals you know four or five months later it was pretty horrendous really but I did it and actually I think now you know I wouldn't be where I am today if I hadn't have done that and um, you know I think some of that resilience that you have to kind of I think have as a leader I guess I kind of, you know, learned really early on um, and I think that has really shaped. And I think, you know, I always try and push myself a bit harder because I do sort of, you know, think now it's, you know, quite a long time since she's obviously not been here, but I do feel like she'd be super proud and she Mm -hmm. would be blown away by the little girl who was, you know, playing post offices in the summer holidays to, you know, I guess being um, at the forefront of, retail industry and and a great British brand as well and was there a a, when when you were little did you have a sense of of what you wanted to be when you were older or any particular childhood dream I mean I I did want to sort of be in I really wanted to have a shop and actually to this day I still want to have a shop in a lovely seaside town with a with a nice little cafe but like lots of lovely homeware so I I think I had that I never really felt like I wanted to be a doctor or a nurse so I think I did you know at one point I I guess a bit older I wanted to sort of work in um in sort of uh the sort of interior design business when I was sort of I guess in my teenage years so I've sort of always been drawn to that sort of creativity but yeah I didn't have fire women or or vets on my list as a as a <laughs> that creativity uh, uh, uh the desire to have the you know the cafe and uh, the little shop it, it it seems like you're working in a really great brand f- for you it it's yeah. That seems to have worked out really well. And were there any particular people that you looked up to? I actually, in terms of kind of on the TV, because I was thinking about the um, like the programs that you know there was no social media, so the programs you know like Blue Peter, so Karen Keating, I can remember just thinking she is everything, and she used to just do all this cool stuff, and I felt like she was a good role model. And um, obviously, you know, Blue Peter was just a, a sort of the the key um, kind of platform of, of what we used to watch and the, and the influence, obviously still running today, but in, in a slightly different guy. So I, I did love her. I think my, my grandma was a really important person because I think I lost my mum, you know, at the time I did. But my grandma was 
lived on her own, like a really strong woman. And actually, I used to spend a lot of my sort of um, childhood with my grandma. I was the only granddaughter, so I'd get to go and do shopping and things. And I think, again, when you look back at the people who have really shaped your life, I really see her up there. And she was alive until I was very much an adult. So, you know, she's had a big part of my life. But she was just so strong and mm. unwavered but really warm and always there. And actually, you know, she used to um, count, used to have like two peas to go to the arcade, but she'd keep them all in like the little shop bags and things and just like lovely memories. But she was quite feisty actually. And I think if she'd like worked, she would have been quite a leader. But obviously, you know, life was very different back then. But um, my grandma did love shopping. So I felt I spent a lot of time. <laughs> and I was really fussy about like what I wore, particularly as I got older. So I think my grandma had the patience to kind of go into all the shops. And my mum just was like, not interested. <laughs> <laughs> it's maybe that steeliness and and that love of shopping comes from, it skipped a generation. Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and thinking of, of people that you've looked up to or who've, who've influenced you, you know, thinking about your career, you mentioned earlier the, the guy who had asked you that question and, and, said you know you need to be on this graduate scheme yeah. have there been any other people like that maybe not necessarily moments quite as pivotal as that but have there been other people who've influenced you or helped you along the way yeah there's been there's been a few actually and I was trying to think about sort of the most sort of pivotal people I think when I worked in BT um actually a friend of you guys Dominic Groundsell was was young marketeer of the of the year and I think Dom was an incredible force of nature at a young age and I think you know he's taught me that actually it doesn't matter what your age is you know you're as good as you can as good as you want to be and I think actually he's kind of get-go attitude and actually he was very very performance driven in a way that I'd not really ever worked for somebody that performance driven and I think the things that we achieved as that team at that point just made me step back thinking wow there's incredible things you can achieve if you put your mind to it and I think Dom is just never he is just so confident in in what he can deliver and what he can get his team to deliver I think on reflection that that played a big part in me moving to other things moving to other sectors so I think he was one I think when I went to John Lewis actually Paula Nichols was actually an incredible leader and I ended up working really closely with Paula before she got her promotion because she was the buying director for home and um you know quite scary moments because you know when you're that senior you're pretty pretty punchy but actually I learned a lot from Paula and she's incredibly warm she's a great inspiration to many women now but particularly in that time in in John Lewis and when she got promoted you know that had been a bit of a moment where she was the first woman to, to take the helm of of John Lewis and um I actually had you know a really strong sort of working relationship with her for quite a while before that happened and I just think she um she was always happy to have a chat with people and you know very accessible and I think actually that's so important with with any leader but I think she really sort of championed and she wasn't very um advert about sort of you know champion women's sort of you know I guess leadership but she just did it because that was sort of part of what she did and I think you know she sort of stands out and equally I um think you know people like Rachel Swift who I worked with really closely I always felt like Rachel's style was quite different to mine and I learned a lot from Rachel uh, as a head of because I went in you know quite junior and had to learn a lot and Rachel was already quite an established head of and um yeah, I think Rachel was a great mentor to me in, in um, the days at John Lewis and very influential, I think, in terms of how I think today. And you've worked for such great brands and really sort of, you know, with, with good sort of strong mission as well. How important is it for you personally to be sort of connected to that brand mission? Super important. And actually, I think when I was on maternity leave and then sort of um, off for an extra year, I wrote a list of like what things were really important to me in terms of what brands would I talk to and what jobs did I want to do. And, you know, that I think the brand mission and, and what the brand stands for is was up there, you know, really, really high. And to the point where I sort of when I let that slip a couple of times and I went for an interview that that brand didn't meet that criteria, 
it just it just didn't work you know I yeah. wasn't in the right space about it the interview didn't go anywhere and I was like right this is really important and I just think particularly in marketing you know you have to really engage customers you've got to be really creative and really inspiring you know you can only do that I think with real passion and you know you have to be quite tenacious at times and I think you know you have to really believe in the brand and and what it stands for to be able I think to communicate and I guess kind of bring that brand to life. Do you think your leadership style has sort of changed over the last few years? We talked about vulnerability, we talked about pandemic, but um, you know, your life has changed a lot, as you said, uh, yourself. So tell me about your your leadership style. My style, I think, is is quite similar to sort of pre-pandemic, which I'll come on to in a minute. But I'm I'm very accessible and I think very collaborative um, and and very open as as a leader. I I really believe that if you get a strong team rocking and rolling, you know, you should be able to give them, you know, kind of freedom to go off and I think make decisions and, and, you know, kind of do good work. When you do have that great ingredients of great team people, then that works incredibly well. So I think... I always try and have quite an open style. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm happy to show my vulnerability, which sometimes you have to, but I'm I'm sort of quite often I'll talk about my own experience when something's gone wrong or if somebody is, you know, struggling with something, I'll try and relate it back. I mean, I do have a team now who are in sort of quite early stages of their careers and actually I think probably one of the things that I do a bit more of now is checking in on people, sort of yeah. talking about a bit more than oh how was your weekend which you know you sort of naturally do but I will sort of say to people now particularly when I'm conscious that there's not been that much face time with people how are you how are you really I got the sense that you weren't you know as confident as normal in like trying to tease things out of people mm-hmm. more than just accepting things on face value and I think um you know that's probably more forefront of my mind than than what it was before and I think you know really conscious actually that I've got quite a young team who are really talented lots of opportunity but actually the last couple of years I think have had a huge impact on you know just the thing the moments where people used to come into the office on a Monday and someone gets married that you know you kind of have all of that buzz and excitement and I think a lot of that has been lost but you know that's when some of the true friendships get made that's when some difficult conversations I think can happen in that environment so I think I'm probably now more spend more time with my team and I'm probably sort of trying to do more of that coaching and sort of mentoring as as I go forward because we have had such a long time without I think the sort of team meetings and the you know the kind of hustle and bustle that that happens in the office that we all miss to some degree and now Mm. we've obviously got a much better balance and I think that's important but I've still got people who are not based in London. So, you know, yeah. just being in the office a couple of days a week doesn't always solve the problem. And how do you keep those people motivated? I think that's also another thing. How do you keep people, you know, sort of integrated in into your team, the culture? And and I think, you know, re, resetting that is quite a key part of, I think, my remit in the next few months. We need more leaders like you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not perfect, but I think being conscious of it, and I think asking for feedback, I do quite a lot of that now, which I probably didn't do as much of before. I think actually sort of working in a smaller brand, my leadership style has changed a a, a bit, and I think the nature of being ahead of in a smaller brand feels quite different to being ahead of in a a big brand. I think Mm. there's a lot more focus on the detail in the smaller brands that I've worked in. You're front and centre in front of your CEO on a daily basis, basis so there's um there's nowhere to hide um so I think you know how your team perform like anywhere but I think feels even more important and your team get exposed to much more sort of senior conversations in that so making sure they're prepared for that preempting things sort of coaching them to they could get called upon at any moment and of course you know when you go on holiday then you know quite junior people are you know, in, in front of the CEO. And I think yeah. that's great experience, but making sure your team are set up for that so that they don't fall and, you know, feel bruised by it when things don't always go to plan 
yeah um, i think is important too so it's quite quite a lot of mental load uh, I, I suppose and and watching that every decision is connected to a budget as well and and yeah, yeah i guess yeah, yeah very different I, th- I think sort of the accountability that i feel in a smaller brand is is much more sort of you know top of the list really and um, yeah yeah being, being able to sort of you know justify your the spend and things it, it feels much more important to, to make sure your team can can kind of I think step up when needed yeah and I suppose the flip side of that being that uh, you can affect change it, it quite quickly if, if you you know want to sort of be more experimental or take things in different directions there's perhaps a bit more autonomy there Yes, definitely. I feel like I think being able to execute things a bit more freely definitely feels um, more opportunities. And yeah, we can sort of, you know, there's less people involved in the decisions as well, which can be quite refreshing. At the yeah. time. <laughs> Having worked in big corporates where there's a huge amount of work to manage stakeholders, actually, I can have a conversation with my creative director or with, you know, my CEO and we can agree something in a meeting and get on and do it and you know that's that is definitely one of the benefits being in a in a in a smaller brand yeah and so what's exciting you in retail marketing at the moment I think actually post-pandemic I think sort of the shops experiences becoming I think something that's as important as the digital kind of platforms because it felt like before it was like pre-pandemic obviously lots of disruption in retail lots of lots of changes you know as people were moving to digital and obviously then it all went very digital in the pandemic but I love the fact that I think brands recognize particularly brands that you know you've got product it's you know it's really important I think to touch and feel it see the value of I think investing in shops whether Mm. it's Primark investing in a brilliant shop in, in Belfast or Beauty Pie who obviously have a great proposition who I love you know, doing a great pop-up in Covent Garden. I think that combination of people being able to get stuff when they want it, you know, that being really convenient to having, I think, great brand experiences or shopping experiences again. I mean, I personally feel like in retail, you need both. It's really important. And I think, um, you know, you just don't get the same experience in a pure online, you know, even with lots of great content. I think it's still an important part of of any brand so I'm excited about that and I think brands are getting more confident trying new stuff and I think there's a bit more of a test and learn attitude and it doesn't have to be you know huge investment in lots of big shops and things I think it can be you know much much more fluid than that and I think that's um that's good to see and I think, yeah you know hopefully Kath will start to do more of that in the, in the next sort of year to 18 months which I'm quite excited about I look forward to that so here's here's a bit of a killer one some people don't always know how to answer this but what are you most proud of either inside or outside of work I think actually again and maybe a little bit of a cliche but I think becoming a parent and I did it a lot later than lots of my friends and you know I think I think becoming a parent is a huge undertaking and actually I feel super proud that I think I've managed to have a little one come back to work and I feel like now I'm in a great place where actually I can be a great mum every day I'm much more fluid in some of the decisions that I have to make and I feel like I'm in a good place at work where I can give work you know real focus as well now some weeks it doesn't always feel like that but I feel like that's one of my proudest moments and you know life changes forever when you when you have children and I think you then start to think about the legacy and the things that you want to leave them Mm. and the values that you install in them and you know I think um watching them sort of grow and learn hugely hugely satisfying and and an incredible moment for me I think that I never thought I would have well that's really beautiful. And have you got a little mini post office for her? Not yet, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think I might have, there, there is a little post office that I, I keep eyeing up, but then there's lots of little bits in it and it's just more mess. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, but I think I might have to invest in that. But yeah, she's definitely showing some, um, some good retail skills. 
<laughs> so we're coming on to the last bit of the podcast now where we're just going to get a bit more personal and lighthearted perhaps. So first of all, Emma, what's your idea of the perfect weekend and does it involve any guilty pleasures? When I do love wine, I am known for Same. Wine. Any colour, any time. So, <sighs> yeah, I think I probably have to put that in there. One of my favourite things, I think, and I don't get to do it that often, but I grew up by the coast, and actually I think that's one of the things that I miss the most, being in London. So I grew up in Suffolk, great part of the world, but equally I love London, and you know I'll probably never tire of London. So I think being by the sea particularly winter autumn days when you know you button down the hatches lovely pubs walking along the wind blowing in your face I just love weekends like that and I just think um, whether it's with friends or family just you can't really get much better than just the I think being by the sea and I think I sort of you know hunker after that and Mm -hmm. definitely would love to live by the sea when I'm older that's definitely part of the game plan but I think wine probably has to be the guilty pleasure that maybe, a little, maybe a little vineyard <laughs> by the sea. Little vineyard by <laughs> the sea. Shop. <laughs> yes. Where I grew up, there's lots of Martello Towers um, on the coastline there, and some of them have been created into amazing homes. So, um, yeah, there's some incredible sort of properties around there. So, hopefully, that's the dream. That's the dream. <laughs> it sounds wonderful. And in my mind, there's also a bag of chips in that sort oh, of yeah. cold, windy walk, plenty of salt and vinegar. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, home for that and then home for the wine. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so other than some nice bottles of white, if we were to open your fridge and have a, a mooch around in there, what would we find? Well, I well, my husband Craig is a massive foodie. So if I talked about my fridge before I got married and had a family, it would have been uh, fish cakes, baby bells and couscous, which was the worst <laughs> conversation because I just never cooked anything and just ate out all the time. Um, so it was a pretty sad, sad state of affairs. But actually, my fridge is quite well stocked these days. I've got three stepchildren and, and my little one as well. So actually, there's a lot of hummus in our fridge. It gets consumed in and inhaled, I would say. <laughs> hummus, I'd say olives, smoothies and actually quite a lot of veg which again it's a different fridge to five years ago <laughs> what's the bravest thing you've ever done I mean I've not jumped out of um planes and things so I'm very sensible really um <laughs> like that I, I think sort of going back on a personal level I think going back to university after my mum yeah sort of died quite suddenly was felt like a big deal actually and one of my really good friends who I'm still amazing friends with today came to Suffolk, picked me up and we went back to university and I think it felt, at one point I just thought, I can't do it, I can't go back, Mm. I'm going to stay at home and it'll be fine and, you know, that obviously wasn't really the right decision and I'm glad I didn't take that decision, I was always here today, but I think at 20 and, you know, I had quite a young brother at home still, it felt, it felt quite brave to go and face the world and try and lead a normal life when you don't feel anything is normal. Mm. as you knew it um so I think it's probably that I can understand why people refer to you as uh, like having that steely determination and Mm -hmm. and resilience because yeah that's 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 tough very much so yeah and I think um you know difficult things do shape you and you know they do make you as well um so yeah I think it's um something that I always try and see a positive from it as well um, because I think it has made me more determined I think I really value life and I think um, having that balance of work and life is very much in my forefront because actually you know my my mum died at 50 and that is five years from you know where I am today right. which seems incredibly scary so I think you know I've got that very much in the front of my mind that you've got to live life it's so important I've always always struck um by that when when I first uh, met you which was was a number of years ago I think it was at, at a marketing society uh, event actually and and I remember just um your optimism is really infectious it's it's something it's a it's a great character trait thank you I think if people would to talk about me I think actually the optimism and sometimes at work I can be 
maybe too optimistic and and too ambitious and um but I think yeah it's really important to be positive and you know every day as a leader things don't go right things don't go well you have to dust yourself down sometimes a terrible meeting can you know kind of knock you off a bit so I think you know I've I would like to think I've got a really good attitude to that and I think that puts me in good stead in work and actually I think I don't get I'm very calm actually some of the feedback I had from a team a few years ago was that my calmness was a real strength of mine because I think I sort of always know there's bigger things out there than you know yeah. the things we do not underplaying the importance of our jobs and the things we do but I think the always that context of of um you know people are important family and I think that's yeah I'm good at keeping that front and center most of the time <laughs> This seems like a strange question to ask, but I think some of the traits that you've you've just talked about might be very helpful in this scenario. How do you think you would fare in a zombie apocalypse? Well, on, on the surface, I think absolutely terrible because I hate zombies. I hate zombie films. <laughs> I don't really believe in it. And actually, I'm like just pretty rubbish, I think, at kind of being left on my own. I really like people. So sort of being left as like two people in a, in a, in a society, <laughs> I'd be really miserable. <laughs> But I think actually, when I sort of thought about it a bit more, I think I'd probably be okay because I think the sort of steeliness um, and I, I sort of think I can be quite resilient. And actually, one of the things often people say to me is like, never underestimate the Colthorpe, which was my maiden name. But um, I quite like that and I quite like yeah. that. The, so I think I'd probably be okay. But I, I wouldn't like not being with many people can quite, I need people. So I think that would be the thing that annoyed me the most. Could have a new phrase, you know, like "Don't mess with the Ingles," <laughs> which, which is said sometimes in this house. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna ask one of my favourite questions: karaoke go-to song. Do you have a karaoke go-to song? Well, I sort of took me back to actually when I went to Japan years and years ago, and I was like, I just don't do karaoke. I, I'm the one. I am one of the people who know, I don't know any full lyrics of songs I'm just one of those annoying people I just I just can't get it in my head but um I can remember going to Japan a few years ago and just absolutely having the best time ever out all night in a karaoke bar um so I don't really sing karaoke that much now but I do love a bit of Adele or a bit of Whitney no the sort of powerful women um but I am tone deaf um (laughs) uh, not even my dad can sort of you know be um complimentary about the singing but anyway <laughs> but you can't be perfect at everything is my my advice we've all got different skills we've all got different <laughs> skills exactly <laughs> well we've come to the end of the podcast emma thank you so so much for being here it's been a, a pleasure before we go we've covered a lot of ground but is there anything else that you particularly wanted to talk about or any sort of final thoughts from you I think we've covered everything I wanted to talk about. I think probably maybe a final thought would be to, I think, any women out there going through difficult times on maternity leave or going back to work, I think there is huge amount of support and go and find it if you haven't got it in your company or, you know, you're in that in-between place. And I think there's definitely huge sort of movement in, I think, supporting great women going back to work, whatever time of your life, whatever's happened in your life, go and find, you know, the right support if you haven't got it on your doorstep. Because I do think sharing that makes a big difference. And I think, you know, you can be super successful, even if you don't feel it in the moment. You've been listening to Genuine Humans, brought to you by The Social Element. If you loved what you heard, remember to subscribe or you can find out more at www.thesocialelement.agency.